Hey y'all, welcome to Fiveable and welcome to Structure and Function of Components of Cells. I'm so glad you're here. I'm just going to do a quick test because I have found that this is essential to every stream and making sure I don't mess something up. But if you can hear me, could you please say hi or hello in the chat box just to make sure I'm not speaking and no one can hear me. Yes, thank you, Elena. Okay, here we go. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you guys have had a wonderful Wednesday. We are halfway through the week, guys. We are almost there. We're this close to getting through it. So I'm so glad you're all here and preparing and getting ready for the rest of your AP Bio stuff. So my name is Jessica Nansom. I am a Bible streamer for AP Biology. This is my fourth year teaching AP Bio, so I like to think I know what I'm doing. I'm getting there. You're doing good. So let's go ahead and get started, guys. I'm going to share my screen with you. I will be sharing slides at the end of the session. I don't share them at the beginning because... I'm a real life teacher. I do this for my day job. I know what happens when I do that. So I'm going to wait until the very, very end. So I appreciate your patience as well as your participation. So here's my slides. So y'all can see that. Do, do, do. All right. Hope you're ready. Go team. And we're loading. Sorry, guys. Just so you know, I live in a part of the country where there's been a lot of storms and a lot of houses in the area have lost power and or internet access. So if at any point I'm lagging or if at any point the screen is lagging or my voice is, please drop a hint in the chat about that so that I know and I can fix that. But without further ado, we're going to go ahead and move on with our lives. So. Don't forget, as always, to follow at ThinkFiveable on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whichever one is your social media platform of choice. We always have great videos, great content, um, great tips for those AP exams. So we definitely want to hear from you guys. If you're someone who is taking some extremely awesome, extremely detailed notes throughout this experience, we would love to see those. Feel free to share. And you may get retweeted or called out on the internet for your awesomeness. So thank you very much. You can also follow me at Jessica Nadsom on Twitter. I don't have an Instagram for teaching, um, but I do have a Twitter. So if at any point you see something that looks really cool and you want your AP bio teacher to maybe look into that, uh, feel free to show them my Twitter because I have lots of cool stuff on there. So, And without further ado, here's the part that you actually came for. You want to hear in this stream about organelle structure and function and how organelle structure is going to relate to energy. So you've been hearing this whole structure, function, structure, function train for a hot second now. And you may or may not be at the point where you're like, teacher person, please stop repeating that. But just wait till you get to evolution. And we start saying fitness, 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 fitness over and over again. Every single unit of biology, there's going to be some phrase we just keep repeating at you constantly and we're going to want you to regurgitate it and the reason we do that is it's really 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 important in this case that particular one is going to be structure and function because structure impacts function if you haven't had that like tattooed into your brain yet we would really appreciate it if you could just go ahead and do that um, but here's my personal metaphor for structure and function just to give you some tips um, because I, I remember even when I was in biology as a kid and my teacher, um, she was from Brazil. And so she had a bit of an accent. It was an adorable accent. But um, she called them organelles, not organelles, organelles. And so I've always remembered that in my head. But whenever she would talk about structure and function, I was like, yeah, they have a certain shape and they do a certain job. What's the big deal? Da, 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 da. And little naive me was not embracing the full importance of the AP biology curriculum. So that was my own fault. So I'm going to emphasize it to you right now. So structure and function, we are specifically relating the structure of an object to the job it does. If we change that structure, it can't do the same job. So if you've seen my stuff before, I always talk about my hand. I can do lots of cool things with my hand, like pick things up and type on my phone. And I can write. And I can mess with my hair and do all sorts of things because my hand has a certain structure with these fingers and this thumb and this flexible wrist that I can do that. 
but let's say I didn't have hands, all I had was this, I wouldn't be able to type, I wouldn't be able to do my hair to the style to which I'm accustomed. If I wanted to pick stuff up, it'd be slightly more complicated. I couldn't click a mouse the same way it's designed. The function of my hand would be severely compromised. And so in terms of it doing completely different jobs, that's one thing. But let's also talk about structure in terms of how effective it is. So my favorite analogy that I love to tell my students, um, because I'm always referring to Disney movies, we just got through ecology, we're going a little backwards. So they watched a lot of The Lion King the past couple days. But whenever I talk about structure and function, I always, always, always refer to the three little pigs. And so the three little pigs, we all know, they built the three houses, one out of straw, one out of sticks, one out of bricks. And as we all learned in kindergarten, only one little pig made it out alive because the structure of his house was functional to keep the wolf from blowing it down. So if you have a straw house, your structure is flimsier. It may be more functional in that it doesn't take you as long or cost as much money, but if a wolf or another predator with very large lungs comes around, um, you're not going to make it. So. That structure is very important to what function you want it to have. Now let's say this little pig lived on an island in the middle of nowhere, and he needed to make his house out of palm fronds because he lived on a tropical island and all it had was palm trees. There's no wolves there, it's fine. He can build his little house out of palm fronds. It's gonna make it, it's gonna keep the sun from, pardon me, barbecuing him on a beach. So structure is important to your function depending on what you want that function to be. Now you've also noticed I've got this little image of a battery. So here I'm gonna get my pointer, this cute little battery. He's real happy and then he gets sad because he loses energy. And so we're gonna to talk today about energy and how that organelle structure is gonna to relate to energy. So I want you to tap back into, hopefully you've had it before, your pre-AP bio or the biology you had before where maybe you talked about these magic words called photosynthesis and cellular respiration because we're gonna talk about that today. So without further ado, just some reminders from your last stream. There are some organelles, organelles, if that helps it stick in your brain a little more, that you should have learned about in the last stream. Um, those should have been ribosomes. Can anyone, feel free to use the chat box, remind me what ribosomes are or what they do. I will take either a description of their structure or a description of their function. Tell me what ribosomes are, what do they do? Protein factory, ooh, I like that. Protein synthesis, good. Okay, protein factory is a good one, um, especially once you get into what we call the central dogma or gene expression. Um, they literally make proteins. They're also made of proteins, very good. Um, what is the endo, I'm gonna switch this up. What are the two types of endoplasmic reticulum? Two types of endoplasmic reticulum. Hmm. What are they? Rough and smooth. Very good, Elena. So we're gonna have rough and we're gonna have smooth. Good, thank you, Sandra. Smooth and rough, okay. Um, what is on the rough endoplasmic reticulum that makes it rough? What is the structure that's actually attached that makes it not smooth and shiny? Ribosomes, very, very good. Great job, guys. So ribosomes are gonna be added to that endoplasmic reticulum. They're gonna be doing some more of that synthesizing, some more of those factory type jobs, very good. Uh, what's a Golgi complex? What's that thing going to do? Hmm. Golgi complex. Think, think, think. Lipid factory? Ooh, I like that. I love this factory analogy. So, um, Golgi complex, someone here said lipid factory. Da -da -da -da. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, sorry. I was trying to get the pointer, but my mouse is glitching a little. So Golgi complex, we can see it. Do I not have it on here? I may not have it on this one because, oops. Um, but if you remember from your last stream, Golgi complex, the way it was always described to me was it's like a stack of pancakes all stacked on top of each other. And those, oh, there it is. Sorry, my little um, preview thing was blocking it so I couldn't see. So here's our Golgi complex. It's this thing in orange. So that stack of pancakes that are all stacked on top of each other. 
And those are actually going to be pieces of endoplasmic reticulum that have pinched off. And once they pinch off, they're like, I don't know where to go. And so they all stack into these pancakes. And so they are going to work more to synthesize proteins. Um, and it's not even they're synthesizing them. They're not the factory per se. Um, Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex, whichever one you call it, is going to be more devoted to actually putting the finishing touches on. Yes, USPS. That's perfect. It's like um, US Postal Service. They ship it to you when it's done. So uh, let's say you have um, an Amazon store or some sort of internet store, eBay, whatever. Um, you have created a beautiful book. Um, but you don't have time to take that book and package it and ship it. Golgi Complex is going to wrap it up in cardboard and put some bubble wrap on it before it sends it out into the world. Very, very good. All right, mitochondria. If you've taken a BuzzFeed quiz, you've seen this one before. What does the mitochondria do? They create energy. Very, very good. Um, think of them as the money printer. So we always hear about the mint of the United States who prints our actual like green dollar bills so that we can have money, get those fresh, crisp dollar bills. Uh, mitochondria creates your energy. They're basically printing the cells money. They don't use, creates ATP, very good. That's what I was about to ask next, Omni-san, so thank you so much. Um, they don't print, mitochondria don't print money, they create ATP, which is like cell money. Lysosomes, what are lysosomes gonna do? Lysosomes. Think, 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 think. Digest stuff, very good. So you get a bacteria in your body and because you, I don't know, some rude person forgot to wash their hands and you sat down at that desk and you picked up their germs and now they're on you. But if you're lucky and your immune system's doing what it's supposed to, it will absorb those germs and the lysosomes will actually digest that bacteria before it can infect you. So that's gonna be a function of your white blood cells. It's also gonna digest just regular things. Let's say your body is trying to absorb some nutrients you've taken in, maybe you've had a delicious cheeseburger. So you've got some carbs and some protein you've gotta digest. Lysosomes are gonna have special enzymes to do that. Vacuoles, what are we gonna do vacuoles for? Vacuoles, what are we gonna do with those guys? Hold water, yes. So in plants, especially vacuoles are going to be very important for holding water. Um, transport, mm, they can a little bit. Um, I will caution you in terms of AP and their tests. Most questions I've seen, they're going to be more concerned with the storage. So if you've ever seen like, maybe you've driven past one of these, um, like a long-term storage facility where, you know, you can go like rent a garage for six months to a year, you don't have enough room for all your stuff, so you pay money to go store your stuff. If you've ever seen the show Storage Wars, um, if you have a parent who's 45 or older, um, you may have a parent watch that. My dad loves Storage Wars, but it's where you just go and pay for someone to hold your stuff for you. Vacuoles are the same. They're gonna hold things for you. If it's a plant, that's usually going to be water. Vesicles, very good, Amisan. Vesicles are going to do the actual transport. So that's like your moving truck. Um, vacuoles are just going to hold it. But it's not just water. Um, sometimes they can actually hold your fat or other storage minerals that you need. Um, but in terms of getting those in and out of a cell, that is going to be vesicles that actually move that stuff around. So very good. All right. Last one, chloroplast. What's that one going to be involved in? What specific process? Makes energy from sunlight, makes sugar. Very good. What's that process called? It starts with a P. It's on the tip of my tongue. Photosynthesis. Very, very good. Photosynthesis. So that's going to be making energy from sunlight. That energy is in the form of sugar. Very, very good. All right. Great review, guys. Sounds like you guys definitely are on top of it. So let's talk about some new stuff. Um, we are gonna touch on some of those again. Not all the organelles we discuss are gonna be new, but we're gonna be talking about new structures which will enable new functions. Um, but one thing I really like to emphasize with my kids uh, is this idea of emergent properties. It's a little bit abstract, so sometimes 
when I'm explaining it, I, people look back at me in their desks and they have this glazed look in their eye and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So if at any point you have a question, please ask me a question. I love questions. But emergent properties, it's not like properties of water. Properties of water, you can list out, oh, it's adhesion, cohesion, surface tension, you can list them. Emergent properties is not the same thing. Emergent properties is not a list, um, it's more of an idea. And the idea is that a system is more than the sum of its parts, or a system will only operate if all of its individual different parts are working together. So this goes back to you have to have that perfect structure to get that perfect function, but additionally, everyone else has to have their perfect structure doing its perfect function. So the big example I always think of here is with the human body. You gotta have a cell to make your muscle and to make your tissue that makes your muscle. You've gotta have tissue that comes together to make your organs. You've gotta have organs that come together to make organ systems. You gotta have organ systems to make an organism. So think of like a human. You've got a nervous system, a digestive system, an excretory system, a circulatory system. Let me know if I'm repeating these. <laughs> I don't teach anatomy, so sorry. Um, all sorts of systems. Let's say you didn't have a circulatory system. Would your body function without a circulatory system? No, you would have no blood, no way to move that. And what is the whole point of blood? What does it do for you? What's that blood do? Carries oxygen, very good. Carries oxygen, carries nutrients, carries literally everything. It also carries your waste so that it can get where it needs to go to get rid of it. So if you don't have that circulatory system, you're missing a lot of key things. But let's take it down even further. So instead of saying you're missing a whole system, let's say you're just missing an organ. Now, I know, I am aware, there are some organs you don't need. So please don't say appendix. I know you don't have to have an appendix. But what's an organ that if you didn't have, you would not survive very well? The heart, exactly. If you didn't have a heart, you wouldn't be able to pump your blood. What's another one? Brain, yes. Whew. Although sometimes we may feel like there's people running around without brains. They, in fact, would not survive without brains. Lungs, you have to have lungs in order to pump that oxygen, that air in and out. Skin, oh my gosh, that one just makes me cringe thinking about people running around without skin. Very good. So kidneys, ooh, if you ain't got kidneys, you don't have a filter and things are not pretty. Yes, very good, guys. So you have to, have to, have to have these things. And then if we get even smaller, so I'm going to think of a very, 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 very specific type of cell. It's called a neuron. What does a neuron sound like? What system do you think that's involved in? A neuron. N-E-U-R-O-N. -E nervous system. So if you're missing that single type of cell, you don't have a functional nervous system. So this goes back to this emergent properties. You have to have the total package or your body is not gonna work properly. And we occasionally hear examples of people who are in fact living and maybe they are missing something. Uh, we hear of people who are functioning without kidneys. They're not necessarily functioning, but thanks to modern medicine, we can give them dialysis so they can function. But their health is not as good as someone who, do ha who does have the total package of parts that can operate all together to create that perfect system. So this idea of emergent properties is extremely relevant. You want to have everything. You want everything to be balanced so that you can do what you need to do. Okay, so these are directly pulled from our AP Biology course and exam description because I like to be really, really, really specific for you guys in the study session because it is my assumption that if you're giving up your Wednesday night or afternoon to come study AP Biology, you probably want to do real, real well on this exam. It's just what I think. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. Um, so I try to keep it really, really, really close to the exam. So one of the things that you have to be able to do to get that full application on the exam is explain how subcellular components 
and organelles contribute to the function of the cell. So first thing I want you to think of here, just from hearing that, what is the actual function of a cell? What is a cell's job? What is its role? Why do you need a cell? What's it doing that's so important? Maintain homeostasis, good. Keep talking, keep telling me things, guys. Hold ZNA, good. Give me one more. Sandra, we haven't heard from you. Tell me something, Sandra, or Shreya, either one of you. What do we need a cell for? What is that cell doing that is oh so important? Three, two, one. They form your organs. Yes, very good, Sandra. So we have to think specifically of what are those cells' functions? And how this gets real fun when you think about, you've got all sorts of different kind of cells. Are the cells in my skin the same as the cells in my brain? No, they have completely different functions. And so those cells, if I pick one off my skin or manage to convince someone to pick one out of my brain and I look at them under a microscope, they're not going to look the same. There's actually a course you can take in college called histology where literally what you do is look at cells under a lab and you're able to determine, oh, this one is from the liver, this one is from the kidney, this is one is from the stomach. And the reason for that is you can tell the function of that cell based on its structure. So if you have, for example, a lot of mitochondria in a cell, it's probably gonna be for muscles. You're probably gonna need energy for that one. If you have a cell that has lots and lots of lysosomes in it, it's probably doing a lot of digestion and breaking down a lot of things. So depending on what's in your cells, that can really inform what its function is. So coming back over here to this, how do all of these organelles, these structures, determine what this cell is actually going to do? That's going to be really, really important as we keep going here. So, da, 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 da. all right, so again, organelles and subcellular structures and the interactions among them support cellular function. This is not just going to be about, oh, what does the endoplasmic particulum do? Oh, what does the mitochondria do? Oh, what does the lysosome do? This is also about how do they interact with each other? I told you a few minutes ago that Golgi complexes are formed out of endoplasmic reticulum. So coming back to those emergent properties, if I didn't have endoplasmic reticulum, would I be able to form Golgi apparatuses? What exactly are subcellular structures? ami -san. okay, so that's a really good question. So subcellular structures, okay, so let's break down the Latin here. What does sub mean? If you've ever heard the word sub, what does sub mean? Under, okay. So, like under kind of, yes. So if we literally translate that, it's under cellular structures. So we're gonna modify that, we're gonna tweak that a little. It's smaller than cell structures. So it already asks here about organelles. These are gonna be the structures that are even smaller than the organelles. These are gonna be the under cell. These are the smaller than the cell structures that make up the cell. Does that make sense, Ami-san? They're not anything specific in here in AP Bio, but there are gonna be components of the individual organelles that make this up and are vital to the functioning of the cell. Like in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about something called stroma and something called the matrix. And if you don't have stroma and matrix, you can't do cellular respiration or photosynthesis. They are not organelles themselves, but they are subcellular structures. They are things that make up cells. So, okay, I hope that helped. Let me know if that is still a question at the end of this. And guys, remember, always feel free to go down to the bottom of the screen where it says the um, ask a question, suggest a topic. Because sometimes when I'm going back and forth, I can't always check the um, task box or the chat box. So I'm gonna make sure this has a question in here. So if anything pops up 
and I'm not noticing, I apologize, please ask a question. All right. So endoplasmic reticulum, you guys are already pretty aware of this being a um, factory, and but there's, it's got a couple other functions to it. So whenever we see it, we see endoplasmic reticulum, so we can see it right here. And notice how it always clings to the nucleus. So we always think of the cell's function starting in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. And that DNA is eventually going to turn into protein. And as we talked about a minute ago, ER is going to be a protein factory. It's going to be involved in that. So we want ER right next to the nucleus so that when the nucleus spits it out, the ER can be like, ha ha, I got it, and pick it up. So it's going to be mechanical support. So that's that transfer from the nucleus into the rest of the cell. It's going to finish that protein synthesis um, on membrane-bound ribosomes. So if these are membrane-bound ribosomes, do you think this is going to be rough ER or smooth ER? Rough ER or smooth ER? Rough. Very good. I like that spelling. Rough. Um, it's going to be rough ER because it's got those ribosomes studded in it. And remember, those ribosomes are going to be that protein factory building it. And because they're attached to that endoplasmic reticulum, they're floating through the little train and the ribosomes can just snatch it up when they need it. Um, it's also going to be a role in intracellular transport. So if it's intra, that means inside the cell. And so this is, hey, we've got some stuff in the cell. Um, how are we going to get there? They don't have Uber in cells. And there's also no driver's licenses. So if you're inside a cell, if you are a subcellular component maybe, and you're on this end of the cell, but you need to get to this end of the cell, how are you going to get there? Are you just going to walk your little cell legs? They can go through the ER to have a pretty efficient way to get where they need to go. Any questions about the ER? Let me take three, two, one. We're going to go on. I hope that's OK. OK. Let's talk about mitochondria. So we've got a little um, 3D interpretation of a mitochondria here. Uh, it just looks like a little alien pod to me. Um, but it says here that they're, and this is again directly out of AP, they provide compartments for different metabolic reactions, compartments, okay, for different reactions. So I don't know if you guys like, let's say bring your lunch to school, but if you bring your lunch to school and you've got your cute little lunch box and it's got your favorite superhero on it, whatever it is, um, you probably have individual little packs for different things, whether it's a Ziploc bag or that Tupperware thing your mom gives you, whatever it is. You got a place for your sandwich, you got a place for your fruit, you got a place for your chips, you got a place for your drink. Everything is nice and separated so it can do its own little thing. That's compartmentalization. And so mitochondria do that too, but they're not packing your lunch. Um, and they may look really simple on the outside. So we look at this on the outside, and again, it just kind of looks like a UFO. It's just floating around, like we're about to scene in on a Star Wars scene. We're about to see Darth Vader in there. I don't know. It doesn't look that complex. But then over here on the right, I have a scanning electron microscope photo. So scanning electron microscopes, these are gonna be these super, super, super tiny microscopes. Uh, the microscopes themselves are not tiny, but they can take pictures of teeny tiny things. But this is a cross section of a mitochondria, and if we look at it, on the inside it's got these little walls, um, these lines, and those are gonna be those compartments. It's almost like a maze winding in and out of your mitochondria. And we call those walls infoldings. So if I take, for example, a piece of scratch paper, I can fold it and fold it and fold it and fold it and infold and infold into this like accordion. Mitochondria is doing the same thing. And we call those infoldings cristae. Stay with me now. Cristae. Sounds like cristae. I don't know what the Latin is for that, so I can't tell you that. Um, but those cristae are going to be very, 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 very important for metabolism. 
What metabolic process is the mitochondria involved in? Think, think. Respiration, very good. So in respiration, we've got to break down particles to steal energy from them. Good so far. Now, I want you to think, if you just had I don't do this a lot because it doesn't mirror well for you, but this is just a circle, so it's going to work. So I'm going to turn off screen sharing for just a sec so you all can see this. Um, okay. So let's say my mitochondria pod was just like this. It was just a circle. Okay. This is my mitochondria. It's just this plain little circle. That's all it is. I have a tape because I'm prepared, a measuring tape. Here I am, I'm ready to go. And I can measure, I'm not gonna do this holding up for y'all because I can't do that, sorry. Um, but I can go around because I have this flexible measuring tape and I can measure the circumference of my mitochondria. Now the more area of your mitochondria, the more reactions it can do. It, the, the membrane is the actual area where it's doing the respiration, making the ATP. So the more membrane you got, the more ATP you can make, which is awesome. But so I'm measuring this, and it's about, this is not perfect, but guys, I'm doing what I can. Um, it's roughly like 19 inches circumference. I know that's not perfect, I just can't hold it up. So that's 19 inches of surface area where we can be making ATP. That's cool, that's fine. I got a bunch of mitochondria, I'm sure that's plenty. But what if I could increase my surface area? So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna add my crease dye, those little infoldings. Y'all, I didn't go to art school, so please work with me here. Um, so I'm going to add these little infoldings to my membrane. So you see, I've got all these little foldings. This is still the membrane, but it's a crease dye. It's that infolding membrane to increase our surface area. So I'm going to measure this again for your learning pleasure. So I'm wrapping around here, wrapping around here. Ooh, I hope I have enough measuring tape. And so if I wrap all the way around all of these folds with my measuring tape, oh goodness gracious, I hope we have enough, we're almost out. Um, okay, if I go with all those foldings, I actually get up to, I know this is backwards, I'm sorry, to 46 inches. So when I just had the circle, I only had 19 inches of surface area to make ATP on, but when I add those crease dye, I've got 46 inches of surface area to make even more ATP. Now, I don't know if y'all are in business or anything, um, but I'd rather make more ATP than make less ATP if I can do that. So that's why these infoldings are so important for metabolism. Just, I'm gonna open that Chrome tab back up. Um, does anyone have any questions about the crease dye or how that increases surface area? I know I didn't measure that right in front of you, but I promise it's real. I did my best in the 20 seconds I took. Three, two, one. Okay. All right. So now let's talk a little bit more about the lysosomes and going more in depth with those. So lysosomes, they're real common in your belly, because I don't know about you guys, but I enjoy eating. And when I eat, my body has to break down that stuff, because eating a cheeseburger or a piece of pizza or nachos or whatever else I had for dinner, I can chew it up and send it down to my stomach. But it still has some more work to do. So lysosomes have these things called hydrolytic enzymes. Can anyone remind me, what is hydrolysis? And Elena, I'll answer your question in just a sec. But what is hydrolysis? Hydrolysis. Split polymers with water, very good. 
So this is when you've got your monosaccharides or polysaccharides, whatever, um, and they're in a chain and we add a little water and they dissolve and we karate chop them in half. Very good. So hydrolytic enzymes are going to break down the bonds of whatever you've eaten, whether it's a protein or a carbohydrate or a fat. Um, it may be more difficult for it to do one of those, depending on which one it is, but that hydro those hydrolytic enzymes are gonna break them down. Okay, coming back to your question, Elena, um, do simpler organisms have fewer pre stack? Mm, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, I don't know. Um, because mitochondria and chloroplasts who have these infoldings are old, like real, real old. We think these organelles actually used to be their own individual cells back in the day, like before dinosaurs, before the first fish. Um, and they did a pretty good job with what they had. And I don't know if they necessarily had fewer crease dye. Um, so I, I really wish I could give you a good answer on that, but I'm honestly not 100% sure. What I can tell you is that the less crease dye they have, the less efficient they will be at creating energy. Um, I can't, since I can't answer that, I'm gonna assume I haven't seen a question like that on the AP exam, but if I do, I'm gonna put it on Twitter. Or maybe just fewer mitochondria. Um, oh, so that's another good question. So do simpler organisms have fewer mitochondria? Mm, I wouldn't say that. Typically organisms are gonna have just enough mitochondria to get whatever amount of energy they need. So in a simpler organism, they're probably not going to need as much energy, um, like let's say a bacteria, as opposed to a panda bear. A panda bear is gonna need a lot more energy to do its panda bear things as opposed to a bacteria, like the one we see on the thing here, bacteria is not gonna move around as much in its life. It doesn't have as many goals. It's not running around trying to eat bamboo. Um, so it's not gonna need as much energy. So yeah, in theory then I guess it would have less mitochondria. Um, but typically an organism is gonna have just enough mitochondria to make the right amount of energy for it. So does that help, Elena? Great. If it does not, please feel free to let me know or if another question comes up. Those were very, very good questions because you stumped me. Oh, one other thing on apoptosis. Um, so again, recycling cells, organic materials. So um, you're in the stomach or whatever other part of the body. And as we all know, cells die. They don't last forever. They're not meant to last forever, but that's okay because we make new cells through mitosis. Um, but when that old cell dies, we have to get rid of it. And so lysosomes will actually break down those old ones and recycle them. They also do something called programmed cell death. Um, this is the only GIF I could find on the internet that was semi-accurate. But literally, cells will self-destruct if something's wrong with them. You're gonna learn about this whenever you learn about DNA and DNA regulation. If DNA senses that there's been a mutation, that is not what it is supposed to be, it will self-destruct that cell. And that's called apoptosis. It will send up a signal like, hey, I messed up, sorry. And then a lysosome wanders in and says, it's fine, dude. And then it self-destructs it. So yeah, they do that. All right, vacuoles. So here we have a microscopic image of a vacuole. Um, you'll also notice I put story tours. Um, I grew up in a house with a dad who watches a lot of History Channel, which means for some reason I saw a lot of Pawn Stars and Storage Wars growing up. I had the option to leave the room. Like, I should have just left the room, but I sat through a lot of these. So Storage Wars is, if you are not familiar with this uh, television masterpiece, is where you have your storage shed, you know, people can go rent out those garages for however much a month and store their stuff. Storage wars is where basically people have stored their stuff there and they're not paying anymore, so they will literally auction off the shed to the highest bidder. You're welcome, pop culture reference for the day. Um, but vacuoles are kind of like storage wars because it's literally just this giant bubble of extra stuff that the cell doesn't necessarily need 
but it's willing to keep it there. Storage wars. It's my metaphor. Hope it helps you remember it. Um, but so a vacuole, it can be a big part of a cell. And so like you can see here, this outline in the dark line, this is a cell. It's got a cell wall. So is it a plant cell or an animal cell? Plant cell or animal cell? Plant, very good. So this is a plant cell. It's got a, a cell wall. It's got a cell membrane in there as well. And this whole thing is making up this big vacuole. So if it's a plant, it's usually going to hold water because plants like water. Part of the reason they can stand up, so like, I don't know how well y'all can see. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Um, behind me, I have this cactus. Cactuses are chunky plants is the best way I can put it. You know, they're not skinny. If it's a skinny cactus, that's a problem. That means it doesn't have enough water. The reason a cactus is so big is because it's holding lots and lots of water in there. That's why it's a firm plant. If you ever um, touch it, don't touch the spikes, obviously. Um, but the plant is very, very firm, and that's because it's hoarding all its water in there because cacti live in the desert. So it's my cactus. I made that myself. I'm very proud of it. Um, da -da -da. So vacuoles are going to be really important in water, which was mentioned earlier. Um, but they are going to be important in plants and other, not in, not just in plants, uh, but also in animals. They can be used to um, store and release macromolecules. So there's not just a drought coming, there's a famine coming. And the plants know um, that they're not going to have enough food to last through winter because there's not enough sunlight, things like that. And so they can use vacuoles to store carbon molecules, carbohydrates as well. Um, plants make fats as well. Humans do this. This is how we store our energy long term, whether it's fat or glycogen. So vacuoles are going to be very, very important in storage. Also, if you need to hold waste. All right, let's look at this next one. Okay, so we're going to get more into the energy now. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions about these organelles that I've been talking about? Anything at all? Three, two, one, go team. Right. So now we're going to get more into the energy side of this. So describe the structural features of a cell that allowed an organism to capture, store, and use energy. So this is going to be photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Um, if you grew up with the Nickelodeon classic SpongeBob, for some reason, I can never not think of the SpongeBob scene where he's like, photosynthesis. And that's just what pops into my brain. Whatever gets the word in your head, regardless of the quality of the cartoon, just remember photosynthesis is going to have to do with energy. So is cellular respiration. But in this case, we're talking about capturing energy, whether that's light energy that a plant catches on a leaf or a chicken that you hunted down to eat for dinner to harvest its energy. This is also going to be about storage. How do you store that energy? Do you store it as fat? Do you store it as muscle? Do you store it in a vacuole? And finally, using that energy. Um, you can store it and you can catch it all day, but if you can't use it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you remember from when you guys were learning about carbohydrates, can you guys digest cellulose? Can we digest cellulose? Grass? Cellulose is in grass? No. No, we cannot. Um, cows can, because cows have like six stomachs and a bunch of different enzymes for that. But we can't use or access that actual energy. We do not have the structure to perform that function. See, I did it again. You didn't think I'd say it again, but I did. Um, we don't have that. So if you want to access that energy, you have to do it in a super specific way that goes with that structure. So we already kind of talked about this, but the folding of this inner membrane is going to increase surface area, and that's going to allow more ATP to be made. In this unit, you do not have to know the specific mechanisms behind cellular respiration and photosynthesis. You do not need to know that yet. You will in May when you take the actual test, but for right now, if you're about to take like, your test over this, I would assume your teacher is not testing you over how does cellular respiration work. But you will need to know in the long run, and you're here getting ahead anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Cellular respiration occurs 
all along these infoldings, all along these crease stag, okay? And so, again, if it was just happening along the perimeter out here, that wouldn't be as much surface area. It wouldn't be as much cellular respiration. Therefore, it wouldn't make as much ATP. But with these infoldings, we can make a lot more. And so more infoldings, more crease dye equals more energy. Within the chloroplast, you're going to have these things called thylakoids and stroma. So I don't know how in depth you have gotten with chloroplast yet. So I'm just going to go all the way through it. Chloroplasts, what do we use chloroplasts in? What cellular function? What cellular function do we use chloroplasts in? Photosynthesis, very good, Elena, good job. So chloroplasts are gonna be very important photosynthesis. Um, I've got another microscope image here of cells from a plant and they got these little green dots those are your chloroplasts and then we can zoom in over here on the left to see what those look like and so same as before with the mitochondria these are going to have a double membrane for increased surface area because we like increased surface area so if you look at your image here you've got an inner membrane and an outer membrane so it's like an onion it's got that double layer but then on the inside, it's not going to have the same infoldings. It's actually going to have these little stacks. Um, and these stacks are called thylakoids. And they're going to be the things that are actually doing your photosynthesis for you. Meanwhile, we have, this would be another, both of these, thylakoid and stroma, are really good examples of subcellular components because they're not organelles, but they make up the organelles. So the thylakoids are these stacks here. The stroma is this liquid that's just kind of floating around all through the thylakoid, and it's going to be a medium for those photosynthetic reactions. So we have these thylakoids, and they're organized into stacks called grana. So each individual little frisbee here that you can see is our thylakoid. And then when we put them in this little pancake stack, that's a grana. We keep those grana inside the thylakoid, and then again, we surround it with this stroma. That stroma is going to be a really good medium for reactions that occur in the chloroplast. So the best example I can think of, um, has anyone in the image, are the green things whole chloroplasts or just thylakoids? Are you talking about um, the image on the left or the image on the right? In the GIF, on the right. Okay, good. So these, like you can... If you can see my red pointer, this is a cell. Each little green dot is a chloroplast. So each individual green dot is its own separate chloroplast. But then inside the chloroplast, you've got your thylakoids, your grana. Um, but we can't see that teeny tiny. We can't see the individual thylakoid in there. Did it? Okay. And so these are going to be the ones that are actually doing the photosynthesis deep inside the chloroplast. And like I was saying earlier, um, if you've ever done gel electrophoresis, I don't know if you've ever had those advanced classes, maybe in an um, extracurricular, but in gel electrophoresis, you have to pour a liquid over that gel in order for it to do the reaction so that you can see the DNA moving. And so that's going to allow that metabolic reaction to occur. Stroma is kind of the same basic concept. You need that medium to let the reaction happen. And then same as before, we have this extra surface area, this structure is going to provide even more reaction space for photosynthesis. We could have a chloroplast like this. So I'm going to turn sharing off for just a sec. So I could have another circle. And instead of having those stacks, I could just have one large thylakoid. So here's my one large thylakoid. That's not gonna be as much surface area as if I just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It's not the same amount of surface area. So that's why we wanna have a bunch more of those small ones instead of just one big one. More surface area, more area to do reaction, more photosynthesis. More photosynthesis is good because then we get more sugar. We like sugar. 
Okay. <clears throat> Ooh, I didn't realize it's 8.51. Okay, so we're almost wrapping up. So I'm going to kind of speed through this, guys. Um, membranes are going to contain chlorophyll pigments and electron transport chains that comprise the photosystems. A lot of vocab going on here. Again, I am not your teacher, but I am imagining that your teacher does not expect you to fully understand photosynthesis and cellular respiration in this unit. So if you're in this unit right now in school, do not panic about all the vocabulary from this point on. I think it's good to be familiar with it and I think it's gonna behoove you when you learn it later. But don't be panicking thinking, my teacher hasn't talked about this in our test tomorrow, what am I gonna do? It's probably not on your test tomorrow. Um, but as we know, biology is all tied together. Every little part makes up the whole emergent properties. So let's go ahead and talk about it for the eight minutes we have left. So membranes contain chlorophyll pigments. Chlorophyll is going to be that green pigment that makes leaves green, that makes plants green. And it's what actually is going to capture that sunlight that spurs on the rest of the reaction. Electron transport proteins. Okay, so I've got a diagram over here. And there's a lot of stuff going on. But you'll notice here it says chloroplast stroma and thylakoid lumen. So chloroplast stroma, that means on this side, this is the outside, just kind of in that free space floating inside the chloroplast. The thylakoid lumen is inside the individual thylakoid. So this reaction right here is happening on the surface of a single thylakoid. Again, don't panic about these. I seriously don't think your teacher is expecting this yet. But it talks also about these photosystems. And so you can see these here where it says PS, PS, those are your photosystems. What they're doing here, and you can kind of see it, it's really, really small, I know. See this E minus, those are electrons. They are passing electrons around. And then look over here. What is it creating at the end of that big electron transport chain? What are we creating here at the end in orange? What did we create there? On the very right, what did we make? What's this thing? Three, two, one. So this is the part where it's actually gonna make that ATP. So it's all gotta bounce around, but it's enabled by the structure of this chlorophyll so that when light hits, it can go zing and send electrons bouncing around and create energy. So you'll get more into that later on. ATP synthase, very good. So you'll get more into that later on. And here's a bit of a more um, detailed description of that, showing that light-dependent reaction. We say it's light-dependent because you can't get those electrons moving until the light zings and sends them going. So that's going to be very important there. Um, and again, this occurs in the grana inside the thylakoid. Remember, thylakoid stacks are going to be those grana. So this is still in the thylakoid. We can see here it's got the stroma on the outside got the thylakoid lumen or the interior of the thylakoid on this side where all these little hydrogen ions are floating around. You're also going to have the carbon fixation cycle of photosynthesis in there. And so this is going to be the big wheel. You're going to learn about this. You're going to love it. But this is where the plant actually takes in the, the carbon dioxide. And we'll use that in order to start churning out even more energy. And then again, disclaimer, don't expect this on a test over unit two, but just so you're aware, the Krebs cycle is going to occur in the mitochondria. So again, we've got, wrong page, there's all these infoldings. And thanks to all of these infoldings, we have more and more and more and more surface area where we can do the Krebs cycle. And so if you follow this, you can see it's making ATP. It's spitting out carbon dioxide, which is what we do when we breathe out. Um, and these are all happening in teeny tiny spots along the mitochondria. So the more surface area, 
the more of that stuff we can do. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, we're gonna do some real quick review questions and then I'm gonna let you go. So review question number one. What are functional structures within cells that perform specific tasks? What do we call those? Functional structures within cells that perform specific tasks. Give me a hint, it starts with then. Organelles, very good, Elena. And what do we call the folds in the mitochondria? These things, what do we call those? What do we call these infoldings? Cristae, very, very good. So we call those cristae. And which organelle digests macromolecules? What organelle do we use for that? When we want to break stuff down, hydrolyze them. Organelle that breaks things down, digests them. Starts with an L, lysosome. Very good, Omisan. Great. Okay, an organelle found in plants and animals. It synthesizes hormones and lipids. Ooh, what's this one gonna be? We haven't talked about this one too much, so this is gonna be reaching back a little bit. What kind of organelle? What's that gonna be? Smooth ER, very good, Elena. That's gonna be our smooth ER. We did it! Great job, y'all. Okay, so you are now certifiable experts in 2.2 uh, structure and function with me, Jessica. So great job, y'all. That was a good hour. That was a very productive hour. And so as a reward for your awesomeness, I'm gonna whoop, I'm gonna close out of this first of all. Y'all don't need to see all my tabs. There's a lot going on in my life. Do, 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 do. So, hi, here's my whole face. But as a reward for your awesomeness, I'm going to go ahead and give you a link to these slides. So, congrats. Those are yours. Happy Christmas. Yay. Um, how can we access slides if we watch the replay? There is no chat. Okay. Um, Elena, so for that, you may want to just go ahead and copy down this link that I've given you and um, save it in a Google Doc or save it somewhere where you can find it, maybe bookmark it somewhere. I don't know of any other method other than just having to re-watch the replay and seeing the slides live then, which I know is not optimal because then you can't go back and forth as you want. So I would just copy and paste this link. Um, one thing I will tell you that you can do, you can take my slides. I already see an anonymous giraffe who's looking at them and you should be able to make a copy of my slides and that's fine, I don't care. Um, so that way then you could just store them in your own Google Drive. Does that help, Elena? Okay, yeah, Elena, I totally understand. Um, it's crazy. A lot of my students, they have to go back and rewatch. So um, yes, just, I would make a copy of these. Very good, but you did awesome today, so thank you. All right, guys, but it is nine o'clock and nine o'clock central. That's where I am. And quite frankly, it's past my bedtime. So I hope you all have a great day. Um, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the ask a question box and I'll try to check them real quick while I'm doing a few things to close down. But other than that, great job, y'all. Y'all are on the right track. High five to you for being some awesome kids. Uh, don't forget to go and follow Think Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you do your social media and post your stuff because we'd love to hear about you. But that's all I got, dudes. Great job, y'all. I'll see y'all. Oh, just so y'all know, I think I will be back. Do, 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 do. I will be doing a session on plasma membranes. Uh, is it next week? Yeah, I'll be doing one next week, next Thursday, like a week from today. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you like my teaching style and all the stuff I post. 
I'll be here next week. It's on Fiveable. It'll be over cell membranes. It's going to be great. I'll see you guys then. Bye-bye.